Well, it's really good to see some of you and read the names of the rest of you. <laughs> I'm glad um, that you guys survived Easter and are here with us today. I have been very excited for today's training from Lisa. Oh my gosh, Gisi. I just forgot it. <laughs> Gisi. Um, uh, it's a really fun last name, Lisa. <laughs> Lisa is in Ohio and um, where our topic today is on ministry to kids with special needs and uh, as Lisa and I were getting to know each other we learned that we both grew up on farms in the middle of nowhere um, and so that's kind of a fun fact for Lisa and you get an extra one from me too <laughs> and one of the things Lisa that you had said when we first talked was that you feel God has called you to empower churches to reach families who are touched by a child with special needs. And I wrote it down as you said it, because I thought it was just the most beautiful. The, I, I just, I, I don't even know how to talk about it. Just beautiful. I love, um, I love what God's called you to do. And I am excited with the rest of us here in the Northwest to just hear um, your story and how we might be able um, to reach these families as well. So thank you for being here and let me pray for you and then we'll let you take it from me. <laughs> Father, uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for Lisa and the amazing calling that you have placed on her life. Um, and even just the opportunity to see her live that out in these churches represented here and those that we'll be watching later. Uh, would you um, speak through her to us, Lord? Would you calm um, any just distractions that we may have um, so that we can hear from her? And Lord, would you just bless Lisa um, for taking the time to talk to us? Um, yeah, we pray these things, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much. So yeah, as she said, my name is Lisa. Um, and my last name, everybody thinks is just the funnest last name ever. And yes, I said that wrong on purpose, um, especially little kids, they love to say it. Um, but most of my students can't say it. So they just call me Miss G. Um, so as she said, I grew up in very rural Ohio. Um, my mom always tells me when I was five and in kindergarten, I wrote a little what I wanted to be and I wanted to teach the kids that everybody forgot about. And I literally seem to be the springboard for how God has moved my life. Um, so I went to Bowling Green State University, which is in um, Northwest Ohio. And I went to school to become an intervention specialist and an intervention specialist for um, students who are deaf. So currently, I am teaching in a traveling teacher position. So I travel around six counties in the very, very northwest corner of Ohio and work one on one with students who are deaf. So if I do sign, I do apologize. It is a hazard of my job. Apologize right now. Um, and then um, before that, I was an intervention specialist. I have taught anywhere from age three to age 22 and every disability you could imagine. And um, just always had a burden for, yes, I might be teaching them and helping them here in the school, but what is happening to them for eternity? What is happening with these families? How are these families being ministered to? Are we allowing them to come into the churches and that kind of thing? So that's sort of kind of how my really quick journey happened. I am one of three girls um, and yes, we, she said we grew up on a farm and it was wonderful. I now live in Toledo. So I went from nowhere to the fourth largest city in Ohio. So that was a culture shock for sure, but it was all kinds of fun. Um, so a little bit more. So the church I attend is called Westgate Chapel and it is part of the Christian Missionary Alliance. Um, it was the church that Leah Broach, if any of you have met her or heard her name, who is our new, I never get her title right. I just call her the children's director for the 
for the for the national office. Um, so that is the church that she most recently came from and is now in the position of the natural, national office. So that's kind of how we got connected and what's going on. But at Westgate, um, about 10 years ago, we had a friend who was working in Johnny and Friends who just really felt that we needed to be doing more to reach these families for eternity. So, um, you know, I could throw all kinds of statistics at you. You guys don't need to know the statistics. What um, you just need to know is that this is one of the most unreached people groups out there. If you talk about people, so families with disabilities, they now say that one in seven children are affected with a disability that would stop them from being able to be in one of our programs. So that also means that there's one in seven families who may not be able to come into a church or have come into a church and been asked to leave because they didn't know what to do with their child. Not saying that's everyone's story, but it's a lot of people's story. So we as a church thought we've got to do something. And so they started a program called Breathe. Um, and it started out just as a bunch of volunteers, teachers, parents, who wanted to come alongside and be a buddy. So if you heard me talking about a buddy, a buddy is a one-on-one -on -one aide, I'm gonna use that very carefully, who just would partner with a friend with a disability so that they can be a part of um, regular kids ministry and just do whatever we can to make them wonderful. As the program grew, we realized we needed to do more and we actually opened our own breathe classrooms. And so we had two models running at the same time. There may be some that could be out in kids ministry with an extra friend or buddy. And then there were others, pardon me, who would be in a breathe classroom where it was very sensory friendly. We didn't use overhead lights. We used um, string lights. We used played music at a totally different volume. They could be rolling or jumping or screaming or whatever, but I will tell you, these kids were learning. I can promise you that. Um, I have several stories of these kids who would go out into Walmart and walk up to complete strangers and tell them the lesson. When I know during the lesson, I can promise you, I had no idea if they caught anything. So that's kind of where we were. And then COVID hit and we have not been able to meet back together. Um, obviously these families who need the respite, it would be very hard for them. Most of their children are medically ill and or children wouldn't comply with some of the masking mandates that are still in place here in Ohio. So that's the quickest, briefest, quick overview I can give of our um, story. So I am going to share a PowerPoint. Um, do you all know how to, and I hope it's, a, do you guys know how to raise your hand on your computer if there's a question? Perfect, because I might not be able to see you once I share. Just let you know that or turn your mute mic up for whatever. But we're going to try to make this conversation, not just me talking at you. So I want to hear some of your stories. I want to hear some of what you guys have done or tried or what you're seeing and how better I can help you. As I'm pulling the screen up, I'll tell you, I too went home for Easter and was so excited. Um, I actually went down to a church. Um, our church down, my mom's has two churches. And one of them is an older church. And in that older church, um, oh, great. What is the ages of our buddies? Most of our buddies started at age about freshman all the way up through. We had some very dear grandparents. Um, and it would just depend on the child. We would pair them one-on-one -on -one as to what kind of need. So not all of our needs could be with a high schooler, et cetera, et cetera. But um, in this sweet, sweet church filled of some of the older, older population, they were so excited. There is a young man there who attends who is profoundly deaf. He is blind. You name it. And they allow him to just run around this church. The sister goes around and collects all the uh, hymnals, piles them up, and the entire church knows what's happening. And they just continue right on with service. And the whole church lights up when he walks in. Like, when I tell you I was in tears Easter morning just to see them loving on this family. So I say that, that it can be done everywhere, trust me. Just a little something to kind of um, inspire you. Sometimes angels are disguised as kids with special needs to teach us how to be better people. 
I saw that somewhere along the way and it just made me stop and remember that we all have unique, there we go, get my computer to work here. Okay, I'm going to share a little video clip. It'll be about five minutes long. So this was a training that actually Leah herself went to. And um, I just want to leave a little piece of what some children with disabilities might be able to accomplish even when others think that it that there is nothing that they can do. So let me get it set up here. Please let me know if you guys can't see the video, but it should be working just fine. season we would have some of our friends from the United States come during the holiday season and bring Christmas gifts that we would then give to the workers at the children's homes so that on Christmas morning they would be able to open up gifts from the people that were important to them. We were just kind of setting up their little family units, their little orphanage um, dormitory for success. And so what we would do is we would ask the kids you know a few months in advance what it is they specifically wanted for Christmas. I don't know if it's a good idea that was. But we did. We asked them, like, if you could have anything in the whole wide world, what would you want? And we got their little wish list. And then I would send those wish lists to the United States, and people would shop for those. And I would always tell them, hey, bring an extra 15 or 20 gifts, because Christmas time is actually a time when many kids get dropped off in children's homes, because it's a season that some families can't face with the lack of provision they have, brokenness in their family, and whatever reason. So we always get extra kids at Christmas time. And without knowing exactly what they wanted, I wanted them to bring some extra gifts that would be good for like boy eight to 12 or girl one to three or whatever, so that we could wrap stuff up and people would have them. So this one Christmas happened and, the, and my friends came and they brought all the gifts and we were we were making our lists and checking in twice. We were looking at the lists again before we wrapped them and made sure that the right gift has got the right name and the right name. And we were going through the list and then we looked and we had about 15, 16, almost 17 names extra than what I had sent away for because we had a lot of extra kids come that day. And so I'm like, well, let's just look at the list and what they want and we'll do the best job we can matching what their wishes are with the gifts that have been left over here at the table. And the first one, it was like somebody wanted a Barbie backpack and it's like, oh my gosh, we have a Barbie backpack. That's so awesome. And the few of us that were working on that little project were like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. And we wrapped it and put it away. And then the next person wanted a Justin Bieber t-shirt. That's kind of a specific request. And the girl that was over at the table, she's like, we have a Justin Bieber t-shirt. And I was like, no way, we have a Justin Bieber t-shirt. So it's like, okay, that's cool. Because we kind of were making some noise, a few more people kind of came over to watch us. The third person wanted, I don't remember exactly what it was, but whatever it was, we had it. And we were going all the way, like 10 of the gifts were, by, were, were there, and then 12, and then 13. And then I we were getting a lot of attention by everybody else at this point, and I began to have this like private conversation with Jesus, like, "Hey, you're you're batting really well tonight." And I, <laughs> it's okay if we don't get it's like if it doesn't happen all the way. Like it's so unbelievable to me, and we'll just we'll take a few dollars over to Walmart. We'll finish up the list so that everybody gets exactly what they want. Like I had all these backup plans. I had all these like contingencies. I had these workarounds. I don't know if you've ever made excuses or made plans for God not to be as good as he could possibly be, right? Have you ever done that before? We get to the end of the list and the last thing somebody wanted was a Hot Wheel track. And everybody kind of like, oh, because we definitely all knew that there was not a big Hot Wheel track over there on the table. And plus the Hot Wheel track is kind of big, something bigger than somebody would bring in their suitcase. So I like leapt up. I had been mentally preparing for like six gifts while well, I was going to say, I'm like, the Lord is good. He is good. And like, you know, I, I wanted to make sure people's faith stayed rallied and they still praised him for everything he had. And I'm like, we can totally go buy a hot wheel track right now. And then it'll be perfect. And like, I, I had it all planned out. And I, as I got up and I'm like, all oh, passionate, I saw this lady across the thing in our, in our dorm room. She was crying. And I said, what's going on? She's like, plot second. 
and she took our hand and we went back into where they were had stashed the suitcases where they were sleeping and she told all of us many of us already know but she told us that she had a daughter that had a, a brain injury an adult daughter she said the day i went shopping for the gifts it's actually easier for me not to take her with me but the day we went shopping for the gifts i didn't have any choice so i brought her with me to the toy store and even though what I ended up buying wasn't totally on the list. She got real fixated on a gift and it was easier to just buy it than it was to explain to her like nobody wants this it's on the list. I can't travel with this. So I went ahead and bought it. And she's like, and I got a home and I was planning on just returning it another day when she wasn't with me. But I never got a chance to do that. And the day we were packing, she was watching me do it. And she's like, where is it? Where is it? Where's the gift? So I ended up sticking it in my suitcase. But she said, I got here and I was kind of embarrassed because it was of the size and nobody asked for it. She said, so I left it in my suitcase. At this point, we're all crying. And she reaches into her suitcase and she pulls out a house. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. It, it just, it reminds me of what I was saying to you this morning. So I share that with you as a reminder that all friends, all of our friends have a way to share and to minister to others. Although it might not look like, you know, we have kids who are nonverbal and we're wheelchairs. And I will tell you their smile ministers to some more friends that you would never imagine. So as challenging as this could be, the rewards are tenfold. All right. So kind of want to start about where to start with this. So one of the biggest things to start with is you have to have good partnerships. I know you guys already have this wonderful group of people here who um, meet together. I think you meet twice a month and you share and you talk and all that kind of stuff. But before you can even really start talking about, are we going to start a disability ministry? You have to make sure your church leadership is on board. It is a ministry that um, obviously like most ministries, you have to make sure teach the churches are, but you, you are opening your doors to a group of people who are not typically churched. And so it does take the entire church to reach these families. Yeah, your children are gonna be in there with you, but what about the parents? What about when small groups come around and they have, a family wants to join a small group, but they can't because their child won't fit the mold or whatever the story may be. Um, you also have to make sure you talk with your teachers and your buddies. And I do a whole separate training for them about how to change your classroom to be more welcoming for these friends. And what can we do? You know, one of the greatest joys was getting to train the church that I grew up in, you know, that the kid rolling around in the back is totally paying attention. And it was still some of the same people that taught me as a child who just have such a passion but they didn't know how to love on these friends when they weren't sitting and listening perfectly. You also obviously have to talk with some of your other parents. You're gonna need partnerships. You're gonna need some of these parents to come alongside and love the parents while we're loving on the, the children. We have to allow the parents to love on them. And most importantly, you also have to, you would be shocked. Most of the children don't realize that there are children in there who have extra friends. Um, I will tell you one of the times I was with the same kid for three years. And one day a kid who'd been with us every Sunday for three years looks and goes, so can you tell me why you come to class every week? And I said, well, you know, I'm in here for somebody's extra friend. And they're like, who needs an extra friend in here? They had no idea what was happening. And so just wanted to let you know that Obviously, you have to really, really, really begin to develop those partnerships and don't just try to take this on by yourself. Another big piece to it is you have to try to figure out how are we going to balance this. The buddies are a perfect example. They work really, really well in a smaller church setting because what it allows is, again, how do we, whose roles are who, what what are some things we can do for children with special needs? One of the children I used to serve had a communication, a communication disorder where she would always repeat the last thing that you said. And so I worked with the teacher and I said, not every time, but she always wants to participate, but give her choices. Just give her two choices, but every once in a while, give her that right choice last, and then she'll repeat it. 
And then the whole class praised her like crazy because she got the answer right. Now, does it matter that she may not have remembered that exact sentence? No, but the joy and the encouragement from the peers, the peers watching her be successful will, will multiply tenfold with them. Um, I have stories like all the time where typical students um, go to their mainstream class, wherever that is schools, and they begin to buddy or take special interest and make special friends out of the children in the schools with disability. And parents are like, where did they learn how to love on them so well? We are showing them how to be Christ in places that you and I can't go into. Even as a teacher, I can't go into those classrooms. I can't go into um, the lunchroom or the recess, or I don't even know, you know how your schools are set up right now. But really, everybody has to kind of know how do we work together um, and maybe setting up special partnerships, that kind of stuff. Another big thing is what are some things within that we already have set up in our ministries that could be those roadblocks? So when I say sensory, do you guys know what I mean when I say sensory? You guys mainly know what I mean when I say what I'm talking about sensory things. So are the lights too bright? Are they, is the music too loud? Um, all those kind of things. What are things that they might, you know, something I never even thought about that another church told me about. They had um, a carpet that had an odor to it. And nobody even realized it until a little while later. And some of the kids were saying it reeks in here. So they were able to get the carpet shampooed and we they were able to move on and all was great. What does the routine look like? Do, do the kids even know the routine? Is it visual? That's one of the biggest places to start is a visual schedule so that everybody can be successful. Are we going from classroom to classroom seven times where that's a trip up hazard or you know that's something that's too hard for kids to transition? Um, those are some of the different types or even do we have places where we know that we have one of the best teachers that you could ever imagine, but they don't get along with teacher B and there's nothing we can do and the kids can sense it and they know it and don't just, just that's not a good place for them to be right. So you have to go through and look at okay what are some things that are going to stop my kids from being successful. Um, I went to one church and they asked me to come and help. And one thing we noticed right off the bat, the first five minutes, they played a video that had tons of flashing lights and they couldn't figure out why their kids wouldn't settle down for the first 20 minutes. And I'm not even talking my friends. I was talking all the kids. And finally, when the kid goes, well, all of that flashing lights, like make us haywire. They had no idea, but again, we're so different, so we have to listen to them. Again, what are some of those things that we could trip up on? If I'm missing any questions or anything, just let me know. I can't see everything with me sharing screen. All right, something else we talk about. You know, we only have our kids for an hour. That's it. How sad, right? I wish we could have them way more hours than that, but we really only get them for an hour a week. So we really don't wanna be working on, well, you really shouldn't be doing that behavior, but so we really wanna to try to figure out how are our words coming out to our friends? Are we using positive words or are we constantly stop that, don't do that, you know, that kind of thing. When we look at the way that we present and the way that we communicate, which I'm sure you all are the best teachers you could ever imagine, but there are things in there that we could build in to help our friends be successful. And a lot of that may even come from working with their individual parent. So I have one young man who, if he is successful in large group, he gets a sticker. And at home, and it's purely through mom, it's not anything that we buy each individual child or anything like that. But when that sticker chart gets happy or gets filled, sorry, I read a word on my screen, then they know that they get to go get ice cream with Miss Leah. And that is something that is huge for them. 
And how awesome, you get to spend an extra hour with one of your kiddos, right? So just ways to try to think about what can we do that is positive reinforcement versus, hey, can you go sit in the corner or can you go do this or whatever? And again, that's just ways that we can kind of tweak what we are already doing to reach our friends. Sorry, I see the chat is flashing. All right. Um, is there anything that you guys can think of already that would be a really good thing that you guys are already doing that would maybe really help with some of this with making sure we're using those good choices or any questions or anything like that? You know, I said at the very bottom, there's something down here because the question always comes up, you know, when you have a child who's a little more obstinate and if there's a really serious thing like a fire or something that, you know, that we always pray never happens on a Sunday morning, but we all have those plans in place. How do we get through to the child that this is important and we use the language adult choice versus child choice? Okay. It is your choice whether or not you want to stand for the song or stay remaining. But it is an adult choice if I tell you that we have to evacuate now. And all of our kids are trained that when they hear the word, this is an adult choice, they know that they cannot play. And they know that it's very important. And I will tell you, we've never had any issues with that. We do not use that language for every single choice though. But there, when it is very important, we will look at the child and say, this is an adult choice. And they will say, okay, they may not like it. And you might have to give them a few more minutes to process, but they will do it. Okay. So that's just one quick thing. Um, my computer is freezing. Hold on one second. There we go. Okay, so what, have you guys ever heard of the word triggers? Okay, perfect. What are some triggers that you guys know, even in your own ministry that already set off a certain friend or a certain group of friends? Does anybody have any that they can think of right off the bat? Certain noises. Noises, mm-hmm. I had one friend that every time you said it was game time, they lost their everlasting mind. And it took us forever to unpack it. And we finally figured out they were so scared of competition that they were anxious before it even got here. And so we then had to work with him to explain how game time, we did like little steps to make it successful. We had a special friend that came alongside of him, a peer who would walk him down we got rid of point systems in the game time. Like who really needs point system anyways? It's for 30 seconds in the middle of the one hour with them, right? So we, once we did that though, things were completely successful. Had no idea that was ever going to be an issue. I don't know about you, but that's definitely one. Ooh, yes, cleanup time for sure. You know, and that goes back to that schedule. If you, there's a visual schedule in place, can we give them the warnings? Um, again, another church I visited, I said, one of the most successful things that they implemented was just using the, okay, you have five, you have five until it's over. You know, we all use a countdown before we're going to start. Well, then they implemented a countdown for it is time to clean up and move on. You're so right. Routine. That's another big one. Yes. Are we sticking with our routine? Um, and, and I have a couple friends that beforehand, if I know it's going to be a different Sunday, I'll call parents ahead of time. They'll preempt, tell the kid it's going to be a little bit different. And even when they walk in the door, I'll pull a friend over and say, remember, you know, we love you, but today is going to be just a little bit different. Here is today's routine. How this is how we're going to do it. You know, it's, and if you're hearing to me, there's one big word that goes back and forth. It's relationship. Most parents, even in the disability world, will still help you and be your biggest fan once you have that relationship with them. 
And if you call them and say, hey, so there's not really going to be a true kids ministry today because we have this awesome missionary who's coming in from Africa and we're going to sit and listen to him talk for an hour. That parent may say, you know what, I think this might be a good Sunday for us to do church at home, or this may be a good Sunday for us to, so, and not that we don't want to include them. We're just giving them a heads up and we're allowing that choice to happen versus us then having to try to, what are we going to do, for instance. But once you identify some of those triggers, it's then sitting down and working through with your buddy, with your parents, and with your kid, how can we be successful? Um, another young man hated, 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 hated sports. So what we did was the fifth Wednesday was always game board time. And that was the best thing we could ever do because he knew that that fifth Wednesday, he was going to get to play everybody, all kids were playing game boards instead of an activity where they're running around and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of times we will let them bring in their own game board to share. Again, a very quick fix that allowed our friends to participate. We didn't change it for every single week. We didn't change it all the time, but we found a way to be successful. Yes. Okay. Uh, any other triggers you guys can think of? You know, we talked a little bit about that in, we had a separate room where we actually played the exact same video at the exact same time at a quieter lesson, maybe with closed captioning versus the loud and crazy and all the funness that we all love, but it's not maybe not something they can do. You know, that's just, again, working through all of those different things that we can do. Okay, so you kind of heard me talk about each one of these individual pieces. Reaching our friends with disabilities is so much more than just changing our kids' ministry to be friendly with them. You have to make sure going all the way back that the whole church is on board. I have a wonderful, wonderful, and wonderful adult male who rides. We have special transportation for disabilities here to church on Sundays. They drop him off at 8 a.m. and they pick him up at 12:30 p.m. And in the middle of every single service, he will march like he is on the world's biggest mission right down to the very front pew and he's walking like this. And I will tell you, our pastor, the first couple of times, everybody was like, <gasps> but once we figured out what was going on, he just keeps right on preaching, makes no notice. And I will tell you, I've had more visitors say, you know, we were a little, uh, but then when we noticed nobody in the church reacted, we thought this must be okay. This is normal. I have another dear, dear, dear friend who has Down syndrome. Um, she is almost 30 now and she loves to sing. She cannot read music and she doesn't sing songs that we all know, but every time the choir sings, she will march her happy little self right up there on the, on the um, choir with us and stand and sing with us. And then when we leave, she often times, times does not leave. She also loves baby dedication. And every time a baby dedication comes, she marches herself right on up on stage. And what we have now worked with is the pastors just grab her sweet little hand and they put her arm around her. And we had a pastor preach a whole service with his arm around her because she would not leave the stage for after the choir left. During baby dedication, she wants to kiss every one of those babies can't do that right now so he just holds his little arm around her and pretty soon she'll either walk off or she'll stand right there and get the message right beside her but again it's all about how does the whole church see these families they're not a nuisance it will start out like that I promise and I say that with all the love in my heart people but it is a whole church experience working together identifying what are some of those stumbling boxes. Again, are we transitioning multiple rooms? Are we transitioning all that kind of stuff? Multiple teachers, different stuff like that. How can we change what we're already doing in our classrooms, both for behaviors, for all friends, please. I have some of my dearest friends whose children are typical, who are some of my worst nightmares. And I always tell them like, seriously, just because you know me, you could think you can be a turkey in my room. Mm -mm. 
What are some of those triggers? And then as you can see, once we've identified all that, then our parents can also be there too. Told you I specifically teach the deaf. 98% of deaf individuals die without ever hearing the name of Jesus. I tell you that statistic because it's not just reaching the kids. We have to reach the whole family. Divorce rates are over 90% for children with disabilities because of the, the, really the mountain that they have to overcome. Talk about people who are hurting and need us. So it really has to become an entire family experience. All right. Last thing to talk about is how are we going to sustain this? Yes, we can do some of those changes. We can do some of those quick changes. For us, we found that running just the buddy program was not successful because it was too many volunteers for too many kids and people get tired, right? I'm sure you guys all have volunteers already who are like, I'm burnt out, I need a year off. So how could we sustain it? So I told you that's when we developed the classroom where we were able to have much fewer volunteers. We have two intervention specialists who teach the two hours that our services are, and we can have fewer people in there and still minister to our families. And so we were able to sustain it. So you just have to think about once you start this, and I'm gonna tell you the disability world speaks. Once a church is known for loving friends with disabilities, the floodgates will open. And I say that with so much excitement. I can't tell you how many times I have friends that come up to me, hey, my neighbor's 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 grandkid has got autism. Can they come to church? Sure, come on in. And they do. I'm telling you, it will, you will find blessings galore with it, but you have to have it set up correctly for success. Okay. I know I went super, 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 super quick, and I hope it wasn't too fast. But I wanted to just try to get some information in there for you guys. And as you are individually, like Hannah said, working through creating action steps, please feel free to email me. I'm sure you guys have great resources out there too. Probably hidden in each one of your churches somewhere is an intervention specialist who would love to come alongside you guys and help with that. I don't know if that's what they're called out there. We call them intervention specialists. Our special education teachers in the school system are called intervention specialists. So um, that's who I'm thinking of um, that you might be surprised or there's even retired teachers or current teachers, people who would just love to come alongside of you and help you figure out, hmm, how can we change some quick things in our ministry just to be more friendly? You know, there's probably untapped resources galore but I will happily, I will put it in the chat here. I will give you my email. I will also give you my cell phone. Feel free to call me, text me, do whatever you would like um, to see. Um, please feel free to reach out. Obviously Hannah also has my contact information and um, yeah. Yes, I love that question, Hannah. Yeah, any Robux anybody can think about right now off your, like right now in your ministry, anything you're really thinking about that would cause some struggles. Do any of you guys have, you know, I have two young men who are um, both young men who are nonverbal with autism, who are almost over 300 pounds each, beautiful boys, hearts of gold, but scare. And obviously they can't be in youth group. So we had to come up with a solution. Well, they were still cognitively down at the levels of our classes. So I actually found two retired parole officers who thought it would be so much fun. And so I taught them just a little bit about how to, you know, negotiate with a kid with autism versus a student with parole. And he, um, I'll tell you what, they have some of the sweetest relationship, but having some nice big men in there with those boys has been a pure blessing. 
that was a roadblock I never even thought about. What are we going to do? You know, these big boys, but they just, they're sweet. Again, I'm sorry if I went too fast. Hopefully it wasn't. I just wanted to try to give you things to get your mind to work in. And how do we, I'm sure some of you, you guys already have lots of friends with disabilities in your classes at all. Great. Any other, like anything you guys have already done to be very successful? Because I'm always willing to learn, please. This is not a cookie cutter thing by any stretch of imagination. Yeah, feel free to share you guys. Have you heard of the Buddy Break program based out of Florida? I have not. It, we, so I have um, my 12 year old who just had a birthday today has Down syndrome. And he's been at our church, obviously, from the time he was born. Mm -hmm. um, and so that has been on our radar. Um, and when we were looking to do something on Sunday, um, there was at the Northwest Ministry Conference up here. Um, it's actually the, the program is Nathaniel's Hope, but the specific, that's their, that's the organization name. Um, but they have a once a month respite program. And it's a three hour just break for the community really for families of kids with special needs uh, and that was actually an easier way for us to launch the ministry because um, sometimes people don't want to be pulled out of church and also it was um, it was a program that I could read through and understand and implement like a, a broader range of people all at the same time mm -hmm. um, so like you we aren't doing it right now just because of the my son's vulnerability, but also um, the other families. And, um, but that's, that's actually how we started our Sunday ministry was launching that first and that worked really well for us. And like you say, the um, divorce rate is high. And um, so giving that break to people in the community is a huge, um, it's amazing to me how many doors it opens because if you're willing to serve there, people all of a sudden don't mind that it's a church. They're just willing to um, help. We, we have a lot of, um, actually unaffiliated with our church, we have a lot of college students that come and help with it too. So it's been even a ministry really there. So that's been one that's been good for us. I see this thing here about the young man who is a little physical, or excuse me, a child who can be physical, hits, bites, kicks, what would you suggest? Some of the big things that I would suggest right off the bat, um, we implemented sensory times. Yes, I'm sorry, Rhonda, thank you for sharing. I'm so sorry, <laughs> that was awesome. I always love learning more information. Um, we implemented sensory times. So I know that that seems a little like school, but so if they make it 10 minutes in large group, or I don't know if you have large groups, let them go for a walk with a special friend. Just something to kind of, the sensory break will be huge. Um, another big thing for kids who are biters, giving them fidgets, things that are allowing them to work, bite on already. Um, surprisingly, most of them will love the biting toy. They don't, they don't turn into projectiles. Everybody's afraid that they're going to be thrown everywhere and they don't. They need that extra sensory um, giving them a special place that they know is theirs within the classroom. Um, one of my churches implemented a special, like they literally took tape and made a special square on the back, on the carpet. Not that it's a punishment, but that's his space where there are some special things for him that he goes over and he can or do whatever he needs to do or roll or tuck or bite himself, whatever it is that he needs to do in that special spot. And he knows we will not discipline. I use that word. We try very hard not to discipline at all, but obviously there are things we can't allow for the safety. We know that we will not discipline for anything that happens in that box, but we put a timer on it. So he's only allowed to be there for like a minute. And then he tries to rejoin. And if he's unsuccessful, then he can go back. If, but it's all on his terms. It's not like the, we force that by any stretch of the imagination. Again, we try not to isolate. We try to, how can we incorporate? Another thing, find out, this is gonna sound really funny. Find out if he prefers more males or females. Some of our friends really, really, really love big, burly grandpas with big, bushy beards because they think they're just giant Santa Clauses. 
and they will be the most wonderful little friends you could ever imagine. And they'll just curl up right in their little laps and they'll never bite and they'll do, they need that security. You know, they'll just curl right up in there and they'll give them a hug and they will sit like that for 30 minutes during the lesson. Um, other ones want the cute little college girl, right? Who just comes along and is all happy and joyous all the time, right? So if you just try to talk to parents, you might actually find that that's very successful. So sensory breaks are gonna be a big one for that child. Figuring out who can we give as a special extra friend for him and talking with parents about like, how have you found that, let me say this, we are not a social organization. We will not provide weighted blankets and blah, 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 blah to make your child be successful. However, <coughs> sorry, if there is something parents know that at school, we had one little boy that if he rode in a wagon from room to room, he would transition beautifully. So the parents brought in a wagon and he rode in a wagon. Crazy, right? It was like five steps, but it worked. Or a, a weighted blanket. You guys all know what weighted blankets are, I'm sure. Just to put on the lap and they will stay there for that five minutes. So a lot of times, a lot of those behaviors are literally that they are over -sensoried. So also asking parents, what typically triggers your child? Is it flashing lights? Is it too quiet of music? You know, I, these brothers I was talking about, one wants it loud and bright and crazy, and the other one wants it as quiet as can be. That poor mother, that's all I have to say, right? But that constant trying to figure out what can we do? What can we change? How can we make that child successful? So hopefully those are some good, just real quick off the top ideas, but please let us know. Anybody else wanna share or anything else that you guys have found really works for you guys? As you can tell, case by case, it works much better because this is not a one size fits all. So again, you guys have my email and you have my cell phone number, feel free to, hey, I've got this situation, can you help me? Yeah, Bobby Joe. Um, I was just going to say, I have one kiddo that I found, he just was having issues like through the whole service, no matter what we tried. And then I one day made like the hide and seek, um, like baby jars, you glue, hot glue the lid on there, you know, so it doesn't come off. And we hid um, just little, like a sliced piece of rice and like a piece of sequence and stuff in a jar. So it was like those hide and seek jars. He will sit the entire service and look in one of those jars and be totally quiet. And he's listening to the service he's catching on but he like just for him to have that to fidget with and to look for like was all that he needed like it solved everything so it was sometimes like it's just the little things that you can even create yourself i found that you know make a huge difference yeah and you said it you know i and that was one of the things that teaching the older teachers here that i like i said that had me a kid who looks like they're not engaged will tell you the entire lesson when they're done because they need that dual input to their brain. You know, another story, I had a young man who was super bright, knew every Bible story there was to a T, right? Y'all probably have the one that sits in the front row. That's wrong, that's wrong, right? So what I did was before every lesson was I told him, okay, today your job is to count how many times I wiggle my nose. Okay, today your job is to count how many times I say Mary. Or we'd get the whole class involved. Every time you see Mary, you'd go, hi, Jesus. I'm telling you what, change the entire way that child engaged. Seems so silly, but what it did was it took the focus off of correcting your story and allowed him to have a special role, if you will. And I'll tell you what, every time he'd walk up to me like, you wiggled your nose 35 times this lesson. Oh man, I said, it's record. I got to try and beat it next week. You know, just something totally silly, but he was so engaged in that story that, and it was, but it took away from the kid that was constantly interrupting us and not, we couldn't get through a lesson, right? So again, case by case, but please, please, please let us know. Any other last minute thoughts, questions, anything else I can do?
The only thing I don't like is it doesn't tell me if somebody's typing. So I'm hoping that nobody is actually typing anything so that I don't wrap up and. <laughs> well, that's awesome for me. I mean, I just keep thinking about how personal this is like, um, I mean, you've said it over and over again, you, there's not a one size fits all. This is such a personal ministry that has a huge impact. Um, that's good. It's good to remember. Um, thank you, Lisa. And thank you to all of you guys who are um, already being creative and taking those personal um, steps. I know that it is your, you guys have a lot on your plate. And um, so I just appreciate that extra effort. And um, in a couple of weeks, when we're on here for our Kidman Connect, we'll hopefully you'll be a bit more talkative <laughs> and we'll um, share with one another some of our ideas and things that you've seen um, or implemented yourselves and um, we'll we'll learn some more from one another uh, and talk about today and what Lisa shared and um, you know maybe think through some ways that we can apply that to our context so yeah Lisa thank you so much um, <laughs> Yeah, we really appreciate you and what you're doing um, and and how the Northwest is benefiting from um, your calling um, too. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, it was good to see all of you. And uh, if you didn't get Lisa's number and email and want that, feel free to just email me and I'll get that to you. So yeah, awesome. Well, with that, May the Lord bless you and we'll see you. Well, some of you may be joining us um, for district conference next week. Anyone going? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> we'll all be at different locations, but there'll be some, you know, things that'll pull us all together. Actually, if you guys could just see the office right now, it's a little chaotic. <laughs> We're sending everyone gift bags. It's really fun. Um, so you guys who are going can look forward to that. So yeah, so I'll see you guys digitally next week and then again, but on Zoom the week after. <laughs> We're all online here these days, Blah. except for Bobby Joe. <laughs> I was in Lewiston. I got the in-person. It was amazing. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Thank you all. Good to see you. Lisa, thank you. Thanks for blessing us. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye.